All right, it looks like I got my request sent out or the invites to speak for uh, some of the guests that will be speaking here. So to welcome everybody, I would like to say welcome to Crypto Answer. My name is Kelly Kellum, and we've got a great show lined up for you today. I want to say thank you absolutely to every single person that's uh, joining us here. Uh, we're going to have a pretty wide dynamic discussion about all things going on in the market right now. Uh, we've got the Rational Root joining us. We've got the on-chain college joining us. Uh, the Real Plan C, Jesse Olson, and my co-host who's been with me since he was my first guest on my very first episode and has been my brother this whole journey, uh, co-hosting every episode since, Mr. Crypto Vet himself. So to kick this off, I just want to say, how are you doing, Mr. Crypto Vet? Uh, are you logged in here to speak and uh, what's going on? What are you seeing? How are you feeling? Hey, Kelly. Yeah, thank you so much. I was super happy when you invited me to speak a long time ago. So... And look what it turned into, man. We got an awesome show with tons and tons of great people every day. So, uh, well, not every day. Well, let me let me turn that back. Well, at least yeah. once a week. But you know, it's 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 really cool. Love discussing and talking about the markets with uh, you know other wonderful minds and having intellectual debates. So it's absolutely amazing to do this. Uh, and super excited to be here. Can't wait to uh, hear you know what we have. To, everyone has to say tonight. Absolutely, and uh, I you know we talk about this all the time. I'm also on. Uh, part of the crypto jeb team for the youtube channel where we do morning show uh, called Co uh, coffee and crypto uh and i've heard myself talk enough about most of this stuff so what i'm going to do this episode is uh focus it more specifically on all the guests we have on, on here is including uh, crypto vet himself uh so to get this started we had an incredible uh huge somewhat pivotal day or potentially pivotal a pivotal day today with the FOMC meeting and uh, their sort of lackluster announcement that didn't really feel like it amounted to much. So uh, just to get us started, uh, I want to jump in with, uh, first, again, I want to welcome and uh, say thank you and uh, appreciation to all the guests that are coming on to speak. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Mr. Jesse Olson himself. We just had the daily close. Uh, following what everything going on with FOMC, whether you feel like you're an expert on that or not, just looking directly at the techno technical analysis of what's going on with the charts. What are you seeing? How are you feeling? Has anything changed with this? What, what are you feeling? Yeah, what's up, everybody? Uh, thanks for having me on again. Uh, this was fun. Two weeks ago when I jumped on, uh, price was at about 43000 I think I was one of the only bearish ones on the call. Uh, then price dropped to 33000 So here we are. Uh, my followers and my uh, you know quick plug on the newsletter – they knew about the charts and that I was expecting a bounce to about 38.5, 39,000 uh, before we would see further downside. So this was all mapped out before the F FOMC, but I jumped on and I listened to Powell and all the questions and stuff. And, you know, there wasn't anything like, oh, we're going to come in and fix the market. It sounded like they're going to take care of Main Street or that Main Street was a bigger concern than Wall Street. So in my opinion... Uh, my charts aren't going to be changed. They're, it's going to be, you know, I'm expecting still further downside just because I have uh, lower targets. And, you know, like I would talked about two weeks ago, there was, you know, calling all this out was longer term RSI below the 50 on the weekly. Um, it still is. So we're not going to be uh, making all time highs or anything like that until, RSI gets above 50 on the weekly, uh, and you can start with the daily uh, RSI and all that stuff. It's all bearish territory right now. So you have to expect that any bear flag that's put in or any uh, quick pump like there was today. Actually, I had a short-term uh, long play in, and I closed that out, and I posted that today. Uh, short-term long in, close it out, and then put the short on. Right. So every little bounce, you know, I was expecting, you know, 16 to 20 percent on Ethereum. It was like 26 percent and Bitcoin was like 18 percent. Right. So it was all within my my range. And then, uh, you know, watch the FOMC. Nothing really changed. And so I, you know, with uh, the traditional markets, you know, I do options trading as well. So everything's kind of lining up that. I don't see a rally coming. Uh, I see further downside first, but if the, I hope for a rally, I always hope for a rally because, you know, if it just goes straight down, I don't make as much as if, you know, 
there's bounces along the way, right? So um, right now, just expecting further downside, and then hopefully get a nice bounce after that. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. No, absolutely. And I mean, you said it, you called it like to the T uh, with your uh, with your conversation and discussion last time you were on the show, as well as uh, all the posts that you do, uh, not, uh, not that everyone's bearish, but all the posts that you've done uh, leading up uh, through this whole downside action has been very spot on. So anybody that if you're not following Mr. Jesse Olson, yeah, definitely click on his image, go and uh, follow him on Twitter. It's at Jesse Olson, J-E-S-S-E-O-L-S-E-N. Uh, and he is a phenomenal technical analyst. But, you know, one of the things in line exactly with what you're saying was even looking at the daily candles, uh, it's, it was interesting because three days ago when we started to have a little bit, the attempt of a reversal, uh, you know, you had a non non bullish engulfing candle followed by a hammer, followed by a doji, followed by a shooting star, which is like almost like clear indecision and definitely not, not a conviction for not true conviction for bullish movement. But with that, that being said, I'm curious, uh, we'll call up the plan C here, uh, because this is, this is one of those things I think a lot of people overlook, uh, just, you know, you know, just doing patterns on their charts and uh, specifically only being a pattern uh, uh, trader. And it's really, really critical whether or not we can become the best on-chain analysts ourselves. We can look to somebody that's truly skilled and, and uh, generous in, in all the information that he shares across his Twitter. So I'm curious, uh, Mr. Plan C, how are you feeling? How are you, what are you seeing? Has anything changed in the on-chain metrics throughout today, or is it just a little bit more consistency with uh, some indecision? Yeah, first of all, I just want to say, like, uh, Jesse's analysis, I mean, I think it's great. Like, he, like the thing for me is I'm not a, uh, like, I'm not a short-term kind of more of a trader. I'm more of, like, kind of like the longer-term play the, play the cycle. So, yeah, just from an on-chain perspective, uh, basically, like, on-chain is meant to be used on longer time frames. Like, it's more, in my opinion anyways, it's more meant to be used on, like, monthly and yearly time frames. Um, just the way on-chain, just the nature of it. Whereas, you know, technical analysis excuse me, technical analysis you could use, you know, on any time frame basically. Yeah. But um, so that's kind of the difference is I think a lot of people, they don't really understand on chain and they kind of, you know, when everyone's, everyone's posting the same charts on Twitter saying, Oh, the, you know, the supply is limited and supply shock coming. And, you know, everyone's kind of saying like the same stuff, like uh, supply coming off exchanges, like it all looks bullish from an on chain perspective. And then the price dumps and everyone's like, well, on chain doesn't, it's worthless. It doesn't mean anything. But I think a lot of people, they don't understand, that on uh, on chain is is more uh, to do with the supply and like the supply dynamics of Bitcoin over long time frames and it's mostly you know you're tracking you know how much supply is available and then what kind of demand do you have and you can see it all on chain and there's a million different metrics to look at it in different ways and do different ratios all that stuff but at the end of the day you're essentially assessing how much demand you have on chain what what's the there's only the thing about on chain also is there's there's less demand metrics currently that I'm aware of compared to supply. That's why everyone's so focused on the supply side of, of Bitcoin. Um, just because by its nature, there's so many more metrics you can look at, but ultimately uh, it comes down to being able to assess both sides of the equation and then kind of going from there. But yeah, I would say I'm not a, I'm not a short-term guy. Like I'm, I absolutely, you know, these shorter term moves to me, uh, I'm more focused right now on trying to figure out the best way to, to call the bottom or to try and get close as possible to know kind of when we're going to, when our true, what our true floor is. That's kind of my main focus with the on-chain because I think there's some value there in, in actually being able to determine, you know, where the floor is. It um, doesn't mean we get to that floor, but it just means like there's a certain level where there's a really low probability we go lower than that unless there's an extreme black swan event. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I don't want to take too much time, but um, yeah, that's essentially kind of how I'm looking at it. I mean, I'm not an expert in any way on, you know, the Fed stuff, like to me, that's the first Fed meeting I've ever watched, you know, it was interesting. I'm kind of trying to get everyone else's opinions to assess what it all means. But from my perspective, I mean, I'm so, it's out of my wheelhouse. I, I'm more of a just the on-chain right now. And then just learning about TA from, you know, Jesse and, and other people. So, but I'll let someone else talk here. No, that's, uh, I really appreciate that insight. And you're, you're definitely spot on. Uh, I, th I, th I do think it's important to, uh, have a, you know, even doing shorter term trades or swing trades, it's nice to have some sort of uh, longer term framework that you can do that within. So, I, I mean, I, I like being able to, uh, uh, you know, gain that knowledge on both sides. But at the same time, I have to admit, for mo most of my uh, time within crypto, 
I, I probably spent uh, up until about a, a year ago, I probably spent less than three hours total the, the four years before that ever looking at on chain metrics. So uh, I might just be a little hyped about it just because I, I can't believe how powerful of a tool it is, especially looking at the, the more macro trends. Uh, but I really appreciate your insight, uh, Plan C. Uh, I'm curious uh, if uh, on chain on chain college has joined as well. I'm curious if you have uh, if you have any thoughts on this in terms of uh, either what you're seeing with the on-chain stuff currently or uh, anything sort of shipping, uh, shaping up uh, for potential change, uh, changes or what's sort of on your radar right now with the on-chain metrics? Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me, everyone. I, I feel like Plan C and I share a brain sometimes. I mean, you couldn't have said it better. And I'm the exact same way from a macro point of view. Um, and, you know, I lean on a lot of the the different TA guys and and uh, different people looking at the short term, like Jesse and, and others for, for that perspective. But from the macro standpoint, uh, in addition to what Plan C said, you know, we're seeing a lot of different on-chain metrics that are looking bullish from uh, like a long-term macro, you know, uh, buy opportunity standpoint. But what a lot of people like kind of to plan C's point, when they see a chart like that, or they hear something like that, they think that now is a good time to buy. And then they, you know, get pissed off if we drop further. And a lot of these metrics that are flashing these, you know, cooled off market indications could last at these levels for months. Um, And that's, I think the thing with on chain, that's, that's important for perspective is it's it's a lot of these metrics are not necessarily trying to you know catch that short term bottom but just give an overall point of view in terms of is the market overheated cooled off etc and, and kind of understand the psychology of the participants from a, you know a more weeks months and even year standpoint so i find that really fascinating um you know we're seeing a lot of different things that, which i'm sure we'll get into uh in a little bit but um you know, when we look at like something like net realized loss, uh, which I tweeted about a couple of days ago, you know, we did see a massive day on Friday where there was 2.5 billion in net losses. So um, comparable to summer uh, 21 during the crash. But after that point, we still had about a month of loss and, and price drop before price actually reverted. So again, I think from an on-chain standpoint, we're, we're seeing uh, some indications that the market's cooled off, but uh, it's really hard to tell if that's going to last for a couple more days, a, a couple more weeks, or you know, months. No, absolutely. And I, I got to say, I, I really love the chart that you posted. Uh, it was either a day ago or two days ago, and it was basically showing uh, the, the two rallies in, in 2021 from, uh, you know, tw- uh, from January into May, uh, that went up to 64 and then the, obviously the, the correction and then back up to 68 and how you basically mapped it against uh, the short, short-term holder versus long-term holder, uh, basically the hype versus the conviction of the long-term holders. And I thought that that's a really interesting, uh, it was really interesting to see put onto a chart. Uh, but I think you're, I think all of you are entirely right. Uh, and, and I have to be, I, I'm finding that I'm having to be more and more considerate or conscious of what I'm saying, especially on stream, on the morning show, uh, or even on my Twitter, knowing that I have a macro outlook. So when I'm talking about it being a buy, I'm also not even remotely worried about, you know, a $3,000, $5,000, $8,000 dip because I'm in it for the long run, but also being conscious and considerate of somebody might be looking at that buy signal thinking uh, for the first time ever in their life. And they don't understand that if they buy and it goes down $5,000, it's not the end of the world, you know? So that's definitely a great consideration that, that, that you bring up. And I'm definitely trying to be more aware of that. Uh, so, th- and again, thank you everybody that, for joining. Thank you, Jesse, Plan C, OnChain, uh, OnChain College. And I also want to uh, bring up uh, the Rational Root here who I've been following for quite some time. And he's got a very interesting take uh, with the spiral charts that he does uh, and his uh, sort of breakdown or, or contemplations on uh, potential lengthening cycles, how those play out, uh, and, and all a number of other on-chain metrics. But uh, just honestly, open floor, whatever's coming to your mind with what's going on in the market right now and what, what, how you're looking at this and what sort of lens you're looking uh, at the market right now, what's going on, what's in your mind, Mr. Root? Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me, uh, Kelly. Um, uh, Thank you. Can you all can can you all hear me? Okay, just to check because I hear you quite clearly. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, um, yeah, what's going on in the market from an on-chain 
perspective, yeah, I think, um, I mean, Plan C put that out uh, recently, you know, that, that uh, it seems likely that we've been in a bear since May, kind of. And um, so, so the thing I was hoping for is like, so we were all kind of expecting a lengthening cycle, right? So, so the, the thing I was hoping for also was the hype to come back, you know, like, so uh, that was kind of what I was waiting for, but it didn't come. And we, then we got the 69K and we basically started dropping, you know, very unexpected. I mean, you know, plan B calls and like he didn't make it, you know, everyone was actually basically expecting just to keep on going, you know, from, from there. But then we got the two, two months, you know, downward, down price going down. And so uh, that, that changed things quite a lot. And, um, so, so I think, um, yeah, now looking more at on-chain and especially I've been looking a lot at, uh, at the supply dynamics uh, in the last few weeks. And uh, it, 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 it starts to be more clear that, that you know, that, that the height. So, so that was the chart I posted also uh, the other day is that, um, you know, the, the first stop was really, you know, because of short-term holders. It was a lot of hype, uh, you know, long-term holders sold off their profit to short-term holders. And uh, we got a top, you know, based on hype. That obviously is not sustainable. And we went down, you know, we had fifty percent drop. Uh, hey, hey Root, can I just ask you a question? Yeah. Really? Sorry, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. I just, I just wanted to uh, say one thing. Um, so when you say the short-term hype that we saw in the first peak, now is that retail-driven or institutional-driven? Do you think those were short-term holders that were institutions or mostly retail? Uh, there were sure both in the market. Uh, there was very much retail in the market, but there were definitely also institutions. I mean, even, I mean, Tesla and stuff, you know, they were all buying. So it, it was, uh, it was also when MicroStrategy was really making many announcements, you know, and, and, and at the beginning and everyone got very excited. So that it was both in institutionally driven, but I think still the majority was, was retail to be honest, but, but, but both of them. And, um, uh, yeah, so, so then when we started dropping, uh, you know, the short-term holders, you know, went the way and basically they have been like nearly completely away since, since the, since we bought them, uh, when was it in July or uh, the end? Yeah. I think July, August or so. Um, and, and so then, uh, then the, the, the next rally was basically just a rally based on the conviction of long-term holders. So we can see that, you know, short-term holders were basically uh, out of the market, like mostly, Obviously, there are some always, but uh, and and you know, long-term holders start. The supply of long-term holders started rising like significantly. So so that that top was just basically a run made out of the conviction of long-term uh, holders, which is quite astonishing that we actually made new top there. Now, also, uh, you know, it was quite surprising with the first top. Obviously, we didn't have uh, a, a a blow-off top, right? We had a distribution top which also changed things a bit. So, so that, therefore, many on-chain indicators did not indicate like that we were near a top yet because, you know, we, blow-off tops obviously cause spikes in, in those indicators and, and we, we never got them, which was like, uh, so, so therefore, we started all expecting, you know, like, okay, you know, this will still happen or this will still come, but it, it didn't come, you know, until now. And uh, now, since short-term holders are basically out of the market, uh, I also don't expect uh, that we're going to have like a blow off top anytime soon or so, you know, but I actually think that, you know, long term holders, which uh, have conviction, they will just keep on stacking and we will have to get slowly back into a, a bull market again. Certainly like a catalyst would help. Uh, and, and I mean, it could be a spot ETF or it could be uh, Apple or, or I don't know, someone buying, you know, or, or a new country adopting, you know, there's the rumors of uh, another country in South America adopting uh, Bitcoin as a legal tender. So, so that w would sure be a catalyst maybe that could bring demand back from short term holders, you know, and that could cause another parabolic run. Now we did, you know, uh, from, from uh, July, August on, we, you could not really call it a parabolic rally because we were just basically coming out of this con long consolidation and, and then we barely made a new top. Right. And, and so, um, so I, yeah, the thing that we, we, because we didn't have a parabolic move up also, I think the, the price will not go down as far, you know, we will not, it's not a bear market like we have seen 
uh, typically after a blow off top, like in 2017 or 2000, even 2013, uh, that we have a year and a half bear market. You know, it's a lot more likely that we'll have a lot shorter bear market. Uh, and and our, I mean, actually, to be honest, I think we're even close to a bottom. Uh, we maybe we made it already, but it could certainly be that in the next weeks we'll we'll still retest that 30k zone or or even have a wick below. Uh, who knows? I, I don't expect to go be, below the previous all-time high, but uh, but if you look at realized price on chain, for example, I think that's around uh, 24k or so. So that is uh, you know that would for me be really the bottom let's say i actually don't think we're gonna go much lower than 30 and so it, we could certainly have a retest of of, of uh, the lows we've had now uh, over the next week so so that's kind of my expectation so i i think we're close to a bottom but it could take weeks and uh yeah it's it's very difficult to communicate on twitter in, in terms of time preference right like uh, i also say like okay we're, we're close to the bottom and then people think like you know if i if, if I buy now and it drops a thousand more, then, you know, I was wrong on the call. But but that's that's not, you know, it has to do with type reference. I, I think long term, it doesn't matter if you if you buy in now over the next weeks. And I, I would probably recommend DCA and, and, and uh, you know, and then uh, that, that you catch an average price of around, you know, thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars like that. That would be a great entry point, you know, considering that, you know, very likely we will go over 100k within the next years you know it's like so um so that's kind of my opinion i don't know if you have any questions further i'll let other one other people talk yeah, well what, one of the things that you just brought up that i think is actually spot on i'm really really interested being that we're at the beginning of the year and we're having this drawdown which is somewhat i don't want to say it doesn't happen every january but i think if you look at the the map of uh, price action in january is over the last 13, 14 years, uh, it does show that January tends tends to be a little bit more of a down month. But just the fact that it's the beginning of the year, we had such uh, interesting price action last year with basically ranging from, you know, 30 to 60K for the most part for the whole year. Uh, it's, it, I'd be interested to see following this quarter, especially with the price having gone as low as it does, going into uh, quarter two when we start getting earnings reports uh, if we're not going to get, uh, you know, even if we go sideways or even hang out and get lower than we expect right now, hanging out between 20 and 24, I would be surprised to not see at least at least a few uh, major institutions or big money players that, uh, you know, th that are doing, you know, earnings reports going uh, right at the beginning of quarter two, uh, showing their quarter one uh you know, books, essentially, I'd be really, really, it's going to be nice to see how that plays out. Uh, but uh, speaking of that, I'm curious with uh, Mr. Crypto Vet, uh, you know, we're, we're talking here about the, uh, all the various on-chain metrics, as well as technical uh, analysis. And I know you've been in the space for, uh, you know, just a, just a little bit longer than me, maybe about the same time, 2016, 2017 timeframe. And I'm curious with everything going on, especially going into the FOMC, uh, meeting today and the announcement. Did you feel like that was? Uh, do you feel like that that was a little bit hyped up in terms of everybody's expectation from an answer that we are either going to get a massive crash or a massive pump? Uh, and then the, uh, the second part of that question is: Do you feel like, in, in actuality, that it's actually more likely that uh, the price where we're at now has finally kind of gotten to a point where these fears and these economic concerns are, are finally somewhat priced in now that we're at? uh this lower level that's for hey. crypto vet yeah yeah um uh, th yeah thanks for having me back up here uh, i've been in since 2017 just like you said and you know watching these markets and um you know i think jesse olson you know he's the one who's been spot on for sure and you know like me and him had a good discussion last time on you know reasons on why both of us could be right you know and said it's super glad to be able to look at it now and then learn from that and kind of move forward right i um, mean looking at fomc and everything that kind of happened today i think a, a lot of people were expecting them to kind of come back and save them right we I, I, and they saw no reason to do that and then that kind of set it off right because we started going up and then all of a sudden we kind of started dropping now I, i'm kind of more on the same side of the route here in plan c long-term investment um i haven't really been day trading anywhere near as much as I did back in February, back when everything was pumping, that was when it was almost easy. Like if you just 
long, you were good, right? Now trading is a lot more difficult and more of the reason why I kind of stepped out and why on uh, BitBoy Crypto Show and other places, I've just been telling, hey, you know, like I'm, I'm not trading right now. This is mostly because uh, I'm not sure which, decision, which direction it's going to go. Looking at TA, there's definitely a lot of bearish indicators, on-chain bullish. Now, when you start putting everything back together and trying to piece it together, where, where are you at? Well, we, we know that nobody really knows where the hell where it's going to go. So are we going to go up or down? Well, I think at this point, we'll get some sort of saving grace in the coming weeks, whether it be with earnings calls, tax refunds coming back. With tax refunds, this could be you know a big stimulus of retail buyers coming into the market, which could fluff us up in that we would be at a local bottom here. Um, you know, uh, bear and bullish is all time frame perspective. So, you know, in the short term, yes, we are very, very bearish. If we stretch it out, we could say we're still bullish. There's a case to be made all around. Uh, but if we wanted to say that we were still bullish, I think anything lower than about, you know, 27, 25, 8,000, we are for sure not going to be in some good days. But then at that point, it's when does fundamental value kick in and find where its local bottom is. So uh, I do think that this is the actual uh, bottom we're coming into. We're about 180 days or something into of. Uh, it's just this the wave since like July and then going 180 days back. So if everything is kind of cyclic, we've been in like some sort of flat top correction, uh, flat top distribution, any anything in that sort. And that can take a long time to re recover from. And there's so many other factors and influences that can affect this. So, yeah, at this point, uh, I, I don't think people got the expectation that they wanted. I think that they were hoping daddy was going to come out and be like, here's some more allowance for you guys. Here's some more stimulus. And then that didn't happen. They were like, sell it all. And, you know, here we are. No, absolutely. And uh, I'm curious, uh, you know, with that, you know, of course, the market is quite cyclical. And that happens uh, in every aspect, everything from uh, volatility to market cycles, to uh, price action, all, 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 all the things that, that, incorpor that are incorporated into technical analysis uh, and, and, the, and the price and the market. Uh, but that being said, uh, I saw, it, I can't find it. I was trying to look for it a bit ago, but uh, I was looking at a chart the other day that somebody posted, and I'm curious, uh, Jesse Olson, I'm, I'm curious if you've seen this, uh, where it was essentially somebody went back and they broke down over the last, uh, basically to uh, most of 2021 till now. And they basically saw these very, very clear and distinct cycles on uh, basically 96 day recurring cycles where basically at the 96th day, the market, wherever it was, uh, within, a, I'm talking on, on most of them on basically on that exact day or the day later, or right in that uh, two or three day region, the price uh, reversed and went the opposite direction. This was going up to uh, the first peak uh, when we broke all-time high originally and we had a small correction, uh, but that actually continued up. And then when we were at the May, the next one was at the May uh, capitulation back down. That was right on the 96th day. The next 96th day was a $29,000 bottom back up and then vice versa. So have you been seeing anything like that? Or do you I, think that's just I, a I, level I did of coincidence? See, I did see that chart. I only spent a couple minutes on it because I just looked at it real quickly and it looked like, you know, some of the 96 days were off. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it moves in cycles. It doesn't go straight up forever, and it doesn't go straight down forever, right? So it was an interesting chart. I think they did a great job on it, uh, especially if they're on this call and want to say, hey, good job on that. But I'm not putting too much weight on it personally. Uh, the things that I've been, you know, saying that were, you know, I didn't call 69,000 as a top, that's for sure. And just to be clear, because you know a lot of people think I start getting really bearish on Bitcoin. Long term, I'm ultra bullish on Bitcoin. So it has nothing to do with what I talk about now about lower prices or whatever. That's just me swing trading, right? Uh, but long term, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. And there's been some alarms that have gone off on, on my head. And I got a 61,000. I think my main uh, swing trade was... 60,738. I posted it the other day or whatever. Uh, and I felt like I got out late, right? So that's where I was at. And then I've been shorting ETH ever since, ever since uh, 4,386. I've been shorting ETH. I haven't been shorting Bitcoin. Uh, I have shorted Bitcoin, but I haven't been shorting it this time because I feel like ETH was lagging. So I thought there was a bigger percentage drop coming. But getting back to what I was talking about is 
Riot and GBTC both peaked in December 2017 at the same time Bitcoin did, right? This time they peaked early 2021. So their Bitcoin related stocks that peaked the exact same time the, the previous cycle, but this cycle they didn't. They peaked early and they've been in the bear market ever since. So I started posting all these charts like early December, you know, Riot, and then you start looking at Mara or Mara and then uh, Master and and all these, every single Bitcoin miner and uh, o- OG uh, coins like Litecoin been in the bear market since May. So they're all, they're all signs that I was keeping an eye on, right? But price was pumping and I took a, I took a leverage along at 32,300. So I rode that all the way up to before cashing it out to 61,000. But all these other things were like going off in the back of my mind. And then the RSI divergence, you know, on a weekly chart dating all the way back to like February, 2021. So those were all things I was keeping an eye on, but it gets very confusing out there because you hear about all these supply, you know, from on chain stuff, but you know, no one really talks about the demand. So if demand's leaving or, you know, similar to like RSI is going down, right. While price is pumping, well, there's a divergence. So you hear about supply, supply, supply. I didn't really hear about demand. And then you have the exact same chart on on chain and I'm looking at it and I'm like, it's going down, but people are posting as bullish charts. So you also have to have, do you have a bullish lens on or do you have a neutral lens when you're looking at the same chart? So you just got to keep that in mind and, uh, you know, trust your own charts and your own work. And, you know, I felt like I got out late at 61,000, but, Hindsight, it wasn't that bad because I stuck to my plan, which was, you know, I, I put out that video in October, try to help everybody. And I'm like, look, if, if all you did was draw the parabolic trend line up and got out, you'd catch the top minus 13, 14%. And at 61,000, it was like, I got out the top minus 12%. So, it's the most basic thing you could do to get out at a towards the top is a simple trend line break and just stick into your plan. Right. So yeah, if we could be at the bottom, we don't know, but there's other things involved now too, like the traditional markets. So if there's a bigger correction coming in traditional markets, you know, fear is fear. So greed can last longer than one, one would think. But also fear could last longer than one would think too. So picking bottoms is like picking tops. And if you're well, going to try to pick tops all the way up and try shorting it, you're going to get wrecked. And if you try to pick bottoms all the way down, like I see so many large accounts out there doing, buy the dip, buy the dip. I'm like, how, how are you buying the dip right now? You know, unless you're looking out 10 years in advance. But a lot of these people were swing traders. So you're picking bottoms all the way down. You know, it's the same thing as trying to short, you know, every single top, right? So. Right. I mean, I guess that goes also back to a basic strategy, which I think you, you've, uh, a lot of people forget. It's like, it, it sounds like an advanced strategy because so many people forget it, but it really is one of the most basic strategy. And that's finding, uh, you know, uh, RSI and MACD divergences against price on, you know, midterm timeframes, months, weeks, three days, uh, and then t- breaking that down into smaller time frames and really, really, you know, basically painting the picture ahead before it happens, you know. But with that being said, you brought up. And, and, and one last thing that that a simple trend line would have saved people or made people way more profit than everyone trying to figure out these Wyckoff patterns. And then I see the pattern go 30 percent in the opposite direction. So I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I've seen this countless times and that's why I don't do Wyckoff or other patterns, not every pattern plays out. And I'm, I see it more often than not that the pattern goes 30% in the opposite direction. Well, I, I trade full time for a living. Uh, I, don't, I can't be 30% off. So yeah. I, I, have to, I have to be dialed in. And, uh, you know, so I, I can't be doing Wyckoffs and 
and then the price goes 30 percent the wrong direction I, I can't be that that off you know what i mean so oh entirely and with that being said in just terms in terms of unfortunately i hate to say it but the the market uh, the crypto market, Bitcoin, it's, you know, specifically is still still correlated very heavily with uh, traditional markets. And the reason I bring that up is, uh, do you think and I'm curious anybody up here speaking, I'm curious y'all thoughts. Do you think that uh, looking at something like GBTC and when it's uh, whether it's going into an ultra premium or it's going into, uh, you know, basically heavily discounted against, uh, you know, its correlation with the Bitcoin spot price? Um, do you think that that uh, is more of a leading or lagging indicator, not indicator, but correlation? And is that something that w when you all are looking at uh, your, your charts and your metrics and you're trying to figure out your entries or exits, do you look at that at all? Or do you, do you feel like that's just something not worth looking at because we are, in, we're Bitcoiners? I mean, I, I, I saw it as, you know, it was, uh, it was in a. It was already in a bear market before Bitcoin was. So I kept an eye on it because it was. It was odd to me that it peaked the exact same time, just like Riot in in 2017. But so I kept an eye on it, but I'm not trading because of it. No, right. But I'm curious, like even right now, where we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, we've got a lot of institutional and big money that's playing, uh, that's coming from the traditional market mindset. That's uh, dabbling with the foot in, in, in both you know puddles here you know uh both pools one in traditional markets one in crypto oh yeah so, 100 yeah, so, so, i've been so, i've been saying i've been saying uh paper bitcoin is here unfortunately and i wish it i wish there wasn't but since paper bitcoin is here i feel like they can uh they quote unquote can uh, manipulate it similar to silver and gold and so maybe that's why we didn't see uh, as big of a bull off top this time, I'm not sure. I'm not a OG crypto trader, uh, but, oh, but, that's, but my, that's my thought of a paper Bitcoin is here. So that's that's they can manipulate it a lot easier, in my opinion. Well, in, in this case, I'm just wondering, like even right now with GBTC, it's I can't remember if it's 13 or 18 percent below below uh, value or whatever at a discount. I'm wondering if you think, like for instance, do you think that's going to come back to parity? Uh, kind of like leading into the bit before, you know, basically calling the bottom by the tradition, showing the traditional interest uh, before. Do you think that's going to come back up after Bitcoin starts to make its move? Well, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it it was kind of the leading indicator. I wasn't looking at it as a leading indicator, but you could say it was uh, them and uh, Riot. They, they uh, kind of peaked first and then been in a bear market since. So, you know, could you say that they're going to lead the way again and, and be a leading indicator on the next move out, uh, possibly. So it's definitely something that's on my radar. And that's why I put, I put all those comparisons out like December 2nd uh, with all the uh, Bitcoin-related um, stocks. So if they're all peaking and all in a bear market first, you know, why wouldn't they uh, break out first and – and make a move first, right? So something I'm definitely, it's on my radar now. Yeah, that, that's some great, great insight all the way through. And with that being said, I, I want to go to on-chain uh, on -chain college here because you posted an incredible uh, tweet. It was just it, kind of funny reading it because it's so obvious, but I think I think so many people overlook it. And that's the, the, the post that you did regarding essentially the potentialities of on-chain metrics or even people uh, watching uh, address, you know, basically specific Bitcoin address, uh, uh, Bitcoin movement within the app, within or between wallets, whether it be inflows, outflows, transactions, or even any on-chain metric. Like, how are you seeing the manipulation landscape sort of happening uh, in the background, just, just in terms of people trying to change metrics on chain? Uh, for the specific reasons that I know people are looking at and using that as a forecaster or predictor. 
Yeah, for sure. And before I get to that point, I just wanted to touch on something Jesse said. I think it's really good. Um, it, it's it's really good to see the the differences between someone like Jesse and myself. You know, Jesse's a full time trader. I'm not. So Jesse mentioned, you know, an on chain chart that someone thinks may be bullish, and to him it's bearish. And so that's why I've really lately stopped giving a point of view of bullish or bearish because I really think it depends who's looking at the chart. And for someone like me, something might be extremely bullish from a macro long-term perspective, but that could mean that we're entering a bear market and that could be extremely bearish for some people who are, you know, trying to get out of their short-term position. So I think relativity and perspective is important in understanding who you are in this market and what your goals are. Um, and then understanding when you're looking at things on Twitter, you know, who those individuals are and, and what their perspective is. But to get to your point, uh, I just saw a lot of tweets today about, um, you know, a large inflow to the exchanges, a large BTC inflow from one address to exchanges. And this happens all the time. You know, there's well alert accounts or um, you, you could do it with an exchange or, you know, something like a crypto quant has these alerts. And you can see that... Um, you know, usually there's a certain threshold for a certain amount of Bitcoin that gets moved to an exchange, or you could see the outflow. So a certain amount of Bitcoin getting moved off an exchange. And some people take that as um, very bullish when a lot of Bitcoin is getting moved off or very bearish when a lot of Bitcoin is getting moved on, because generally Bitcoin moved on to an exchange, you know, could mean that there could be a dump, someone's trying to sell it and vice versa. My point today was just take that with a grain of salt, because there are so many people watching on chain right now, including myself, and we're posting about it. And there are some large accounts here, you know, in this spaces right now, but also just in general that have large followings. And if we were to post about every single individual move, you know, I think whales are aware of that, um, or at least some of them could be aware of that and could potentially use that to, you know, either invoke fear or invoke confidence. So, um, I just don't personally pay attention to it. If others want to, that's you know that's certainly their choice. For me, it's more about the trend over weeks or months. So um, you know, there's exchange net thirty day position change. There's exchange balance change. There's all these different things that you can look at. Where um, you know I I zoom out of the last week to two weeks because the data could always fluctuate a little bit based on. Um, Glassnode or CryptoQuant getting new information. So I really look for trends over the prior months and, and prior years. And that's more important to me. So like, for instance, exchange balance, balance trend pretty much was up only up until March 2020. And so Bitcoin was being moved on to, uh, well, just the big, I should just say the exchange balances were growing uh, up until March 2020. And then during March 2020, we've been in a macro downtrend of the exchange balances um, you know, obviously during the May crash in 2021, we saw a spike up in exchange balances, but it's been a macro downtrend. So for me, that's, that's more important. And that's something that I'm watching closer and I'm seeing if that's going to shift, you know, over, you know, a multi-month period, um, versus just an individual address sending a thousand BTC. If I can hop in there. Um, yeah, uh, good, good, uh, point there. Uh, I, I think, uh, just also to to get back to GBTC for just one second, when it was trading at a premium uh, in, in in the beginning of the first bull run, um, there was, GBTC was was scooping up many coins, right? Like I think in total or so, they bought like 400k coins or so, which we added to the strength of the bull market. And uh, when they started trading at a discount, obviously they were buying. Bitcoin, right? So, so that that also doesn't help uh, to get to get back in into bull market. So, uh, as soon as we start pre trading at a premium, uh, you know, they're they're probably going to buy coins again, and 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 that will help, you know, in terms of uh, illiquid supply. Let's say that 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 will go up. Uh, then, then to get back to uh, on chain college college's point uh, about exchange flows. Um, yeah, you definitely have to take them with a grain of salt. Anyway, like at least uh, you cannot look at them on, on like the, the the last two weeks or so. They can make many changes on 
on uh, Glassnode uh, because, you know, new addresses that were previously unknown suddenly are added and then it changes the whole perspective. So uh, so you can only look at historical trends. And then even there, we have to take things into context. And that's, that's often the problem with on-chain. On-chain is very cool, but you always have to look at it in the broader macro context um, because we had the China ban and the, the, the spot trading ban in China, which actually, you know, Hobie Exchange, for example, they I, I think it was also around 400k coins that they uh you know that are that were you know drawn from the exchange right so so this has a huge effect on the on the general you know if you look at uh, exchange flows from all exchanges then you know 400 coins extra that have been drawn uh, of like changes their perspective quite radically you know like so that uh so so those things have to be taken into consideration now i've been paying attention to also china uh to the the trends uh between uh europe us and china i've been i've kept tracking them uh, since uh, the end of december uh and and it seems china is really not selling anymore so it's it's uh, it's actually mainly the sell pressure in the last months came from the us and uh probably also some because of the 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 liquidations uh, um you know that happened uh so leverage and so so um uh but but china has actually been pos- in the positive uh, uh if you look at the the price uh, fluctuations from uh during chinese work hours so so that's uh, that's a good thing Oh yeah, no, I, right. I, I completely agree with you. There was a, also somebody I forget who shared it, uh, but uh, somebody might have been one of the one of the speakers here. But somebody was posting. Uh, they were showing the essentially from, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not looking at my chart right now. I think it was December 21st is when we had the start of this uh, last uh, major, you know, true downtrend that we we've been, uh, you know, <laughs> coasting through since since and. Uh, they were, it was basically a map showing the uh, the sell pressure from different regions of the world. And uh, the first part of that for about three weeks, and I, I think most of it was leading up to December 31st, which was, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the deadline uh, for some of the mandates that the Chinese government put out for people uh, getting rid of, or, or you know, the legality they had about regarding holding crypto or trading crypto. And so there was a, a somewhat of a, uh, influx or massive uh, uh, outweighing of uh, sell pressure uh, globally uh, from the, the Asian region and specifically more China. Uh, and then, you know, that also, just like anything, when momentum starts shifting in a direction, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Once it picks up enough speed, uh, other people start selling as well. So just exactly as you said, uh, the the map, uh, the global map showing of where the, the cell pressure was coming from initially was China and then sort of rolled over to now being more U.S. based, uh, which, you know, at the end of the day, just like anything, it goes back to what we were saying earlier, you know, things are cyclical. And so it's going to take a, a little bit, you know, uh, we're a massive, massive, uh, you know, massive oil tanker now, whereas before, you know, three Three years ago, even five years ago, eight years ago, we were a small, small little speedboat, which is very easy to turn and, and uh, navigate and manipulate it, uh, you know, its direction in, in, in the water, in this case, in the market. And now that we're so large, once momentum picks up in any direction, it does take a while to uh, at least stabilize confidence before confidence can start increasing again. So with that being said, I want to jump to crypto vet here. Uh, you know, you've been in the market, uh, you know, for quite a while now and uh you know being that uh, i don't i don't know if anybody uh, uh the majority i would say of people that are uh non-traditional finance people that have jumped into crypto which is uh before this year i would say is the large majority of people you know uh but now that we're having all especially with the last two years uh three years of the pandemic and all this other stuff going on with the you know the fears of inflation concerns and uh, all these fomc meetings regarding interest rate hikes do you think that coming out of today's meeting, now going through February and now going into March, when uh, the the interest rate hikes they said are basically are going to happen and the quantitative easing is going to uh, basically be trickling, uh, coming coming down uh, through the end of March and then at that point it should be uh, ending. Uh, do you think that uh, price will already be price and fear will already be baked, you know, be baked into the price at that point, or do you think? Once we get to that point, it's going to be another 
uh, day that feels like the like the Super Bowl or championship game in crypto again because everybody's expecting Daddy to come in, uh, as you said, with Jerome Powell come in and save the day. Or do you think that that's going to be a little bit less of a uh, more of a non-event because people are already aware that this is kind of doesn't re- in reality shouldn't affect a Bitcoin because t- technically Bitcoin should be an unrelated market, but it obviously still is. So I, I guess I'm more in the sense do I. Do I think that here in a couple of months, j and all the quantitative easing in the sense is already priced in? Um, that I, I don't quite think fully yet. I think Jesse may be onto something that, you know, usually when if we're with the way the charts and everything look, they're still more bearish than bullish. We, you know, we could find a bottom here. We could bounce around, have a little relief rally, go up to, you know, 44,000 and then come back down and then actually find a bottom at somewhere around here at the 30. Uh, but for looking into the future and how everything is going to go, if we have a lot of bad things happen, you know, geopolitically with Russia, China, things like that, um, the, the lot of, those can drastically change how things are going to go here on our side, right? So um, as far as looking that far in the future, I, you know, hope for the best. And I don't think that any of those things will come to fruition and cause any pain and harm to the the, the economy or markets in, in any way, shape or form. But, you know, we're hoping for the best as we push forward that this isn't going to be an issue and that employment will go up and inflation isn't actually happening, but it kind of is, right? We, we, I mean, the the term hawkish and dovish, I honestly hadn't even thought about that until everybody started bringing it up again today. It's been literally years since I had it. I had to remember even what dovish was, the low employment thing. So, you know, uh, I definitely think inflation is probably our biggest problem now, just due to the fact that, like Jay Powell said, people are demanding higher prices for wage. If higher prices and wage and we have low productivity overall, well, that's not very good. Why should you get paid more if our productivity and overall co- country can't deliver and produce? So, you know, we're, we're still in for some some time to recover here. Will we have will we continue going down? Uh, I, I hope they do something to, to fix it because what they're doing isn't working. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, agree. And uh, so we're going to be wrapping up here in about 25 minutes. Before we wrap up, I, I do see there's three requested people. So those are the three questions that we're going to answer here in a moment. Uh, before we do that, I just want to, again, say thank you, everybody, for listening uh, here on Crypto Answered. We do this uh, once a week, either Wednesday or Thursday, depending on what's going on in the market. Uh, my name's Kelly Kell. I'm Crypto Vet here as uh, my co-host. We got the, the wonderful technical analyst and personality, Mr. Jesse Olson. Definitely go and follow him on his Twitter, The Real Plan C. Uh, you can follow him on his Twitter. He's got incredible on-chain metrics and a lot of great content on, on his uh, Twitter daily, uh, as well as on-chain college. All, all uh, three of those uh, are incredible. And then one of, one of the people I've been following for a long time, The Rational Root, he's just got a very interesting takes uh, slightly different in terms of how he charts his stuff, which I really appreciate because there's a lot of a lot of charts out there that seem a bit repetitive amongst a lot of people. And I'm happy to say all the people that are speaking today all go out there and they make their own unique takes on what's going on, whether it be technical analysis or on-chain metrics. So definitely follow them on Twitter. And uh, again, I want to say thank you to all of them for joining. And before we go, like I said, we're hey, going hey, to answer three hey, people here. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to just really quickly give like kind of my overview, um, just kind of 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 because I'm a, a lot like I said before, like I look at the market, you know, in, in quite long term perspective. Um, I just wanted to quickly say, uh, kind of how I just put these pieces together the last few weeks. Um, so, so basically, my perspective on on what where we like what has got us to this point, and kind of where where things are looking uh, over this next year or two. So, the way I'm looking at it is, you know, we had that initial run up at the beginning of 2021. Now, like uh, the Rue was saying, you know, that was short-term holders that got in. I believe the market, the long-term holders, expected plus 100 Bitcoin. I think most people expected plus 100 Bitcoin. And this, so there's a combination of events that happened. One was we didn't hit our target, which everyone was expecting over $100,000 or over 100,000 Bitcoin for this cycle. The second thing that happened was basically... Um, yeah, so, so yeah, we had our first distribution top. So like all the, all the previous peaks, even though there's not a, a lot of samples, you know, 2013 and 2017 were both completely parabolic parabola tops. So we had our first distribution top and we didn't hit our target. And I think the long-term holders, 
basically were not convinced it was the peak and they basically were not willing to sell at those prices. And so the short-term holders got in, they went up, they, and, and basically what happened is the long-term holders just held through that whole drop. And like, like we talked about before, all the on-chain metrics that I'm looking at, like, like uh, new entities, um, supply held over a year, short-term holder, supply held in profit, all those metrics peaked in, in April. And so all the on-chain data shows that that was the peak. And what happened though was, like, like we kind of talked about, is the long-term holders weren't convinced it was the true top of the cycle and they weren't willing to sell at those prices. So we went into a short-term bear market or a correction phase, you could call it. But what happened was we started to get a lot of shorts in the middle of last year. And then we had a big short squeeze that pushed us from 29 really rapidly up to 40. So we had that short squeeze that, that propelled us back up. And then what happened on top of that was you had basically the long-term holders that were still not willing to sell. And so basically the price kept going and we somehow managed to get up to 69,000 during a bear, in my opinion, a, a, a bearish correction phase. I wouldn't call it a bear market. I'd call it a bearish correction phase within a bull market, you know, kind of cycle. So now where we're at is I believe that a lot of people have actually felt like we're in a, bear, a bull market this whole time. We've really been... It's terminology, but I call it a, I calling it a, a, a correction phase. Um, the guys like, uh, shout out to like uh, tech, tech Dev, right? He, he kind of, you know, with this terminology basically saying it, it's more of a, a correction phase within a bull, bullish uptrend. But the point being is, I believe we're actually, a lot of indicators are showing that we're actually getting close to coming out of this correction phase that we've been in since uh, really April of 2021. And so the, in my opinion, the bear market's not anytime soon. I believe we're actually coming out of a correction phase that we put on an all-time high in because of that long-term holder conviction. And the demand side of Bitcoin, to speak to Jesse's point, because not very many on-chain analysts look at the demand side. The reason why is because there's only actually one metric that I'm aware of for the demand side of Bitcoin. I posted about this a couple, uh, not like a week or so ago. It's called new entities. And this metric, I mean, most people don't have access to because it's a tier three uh, metric on Glassnode. This metric showed again, we peaked in April and we've been actually currently today, um, the demand for Bitcoin is low. So we've had low demand for Bitcoin for a, like coming up on, you know, nine months now. And so net new entities is basically saying, you know, new, new entities or, or it's saying new uh, people coming into the market, right? So you can look at the wallets, but the, the entities, they actually take all the wallet data, and then they figure out which wallets are connected to individuals through their algorithms. So it's more of an accurate representation of actually new participants in the market. And that's been low for, like I said, nine months now. So the demand side of Bitcoin is very low. The demand side of Bitcoin has been bearish since April of last year, but the supply side has stayed bullish this entire cycle. And so that's why it, it cushioned the blow of this correction phase we've been in. But like I said, I believe we're coming out of this and we're going to resume the bullish uptrend. Um, we just need a catalyst. The supply side, like everyone's been saying, supply side from an on-chain perspective is super bullish. I don't know where the bottom is as far as like, you know, technical analysis wise. I'm looking at on-chain data and I'm, I believe it's around 30,000. But when we put in that bottom, if we get a catalyst, this cycle is going to continue and it's not over. And in my opinion, it's going to finish late this year or early next year. That's my perspective anyways. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank that's you my hope for sure. Yeah, if I can so hop in there for a that. second, Plan C, to just yeah, add I'm... some, add something on there. So I, I fully agree with with everything you just said. Actually, um, the 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 thing is, um, so yeah, it's it's very much of a definition problem, right? Like bear market, bull market. I mean, uh, everyone has their own definitions, so it's it's difficult to 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 know what we mean, right? So um, so I so I think we have been kind of in a bear market since and indeed since April. But it's it's not the typical bear market that we had, you know, in, in 2018, 19, or in 2014, 15, 16. Uh, that, you know, it's it's a it's a different uh, type of of bear. It's just a bear bearish trend or a correction phase. But uh, you know, lengthening cycles. Also, again, here we have this definition problem, right? Because what if we would 
like now just slowly grind up because we we do have a huddle army that's clear you know otherwise we wouldn't have made uh, uh a, a 69k top uh you know like just based on long-term holders which is incredible to be honest and very promising for the future because this is uh, this is growing you know this is uh, uh, liquid supply is growing uh long-term holders uh, are growing and and over time so that so that's very bullish <clears throat> so um but uh it, you know, thinking of lengthening cycles. So if we would start, if we now just would make a bottom soon, like in these weeks or so, and we start slowly grinding up and in the end of the year, we would make a new all-time high. So before the next halving, you know, that's, a, would we then call it a lengthening cycle or would we just say a complete new cycle? You know, because that that's what I'm uh, been, uh, thinking about. Lately. Like, you know, maybe the top was in, in, in April and that was just the cycle, you know, the cycle was over. And then we get a new bull market with, uh, you know, air market, like, you know, we're slowly building up because for me, uh, like also part of the definition of a, a, uh, a cycle or at least, or making a parabolic move up and new making really new highs is to have demand, you know, and have like new short term holders come in. And, and we had that, you know, up until April, but then it stopped. So in a way, that means that, that you know, we've been in a bear market since, uh, even though we made new highs. But once these short-term holders are starting to come back, and that is something we can, you know, easily track on chain, which is, you know, it's, a, it's, it's such, such a cool tool. Um, but uh, so, so I think, like, I would argue that maybe that would be the start of a new cycle, even though that catalyst could happen. Like, it, it, you know, the catalyst for last cycle was the halving again. But maybe we will get, you know, spot ETF or, you know, another country adopting Bitcoin, which will tr track again those short term holders. And then we start, you know, we, we continue the, the I, either you call it the continuance of the of the previous market. Although I would argue maybe it's just a, a new a new cycle overall. Right. Like a new bull market uh, uh, on a shorter uh, time frame. So uh, so that's just something I, I wanted to add. No, I, I completely agree with that. It's, you know, I think the, the problem that we have with looking at this, these markets sometimes is sometimes we draw either correlations that aren't there. Like, for instance, when I was talking about the 96 day cycle, is that really a true thing or is it just a correlation that we want to see? Or the other, the other part of that is, as you said perfectly, is we want this to fit into this uh, historical four year cycle that's slightly lengthening by uh, whether it be a few weeks or a few months. Uh, each cycle. But in reality, at the end of the day, what we did was we had a 2017 uh, blow off top into 2018 that came down, uh, you know, into the, the breakdown to the, the 6,000 down to the 3,000 level. Then we had a little mini bear mar uh, bull market that went up to 14s and came back down. Then we had the COVID crash down to 3,000. And that was, you know, essentially a new bull market up to and so we're having these mini markets w within, and I don't think we need to always categorize it as whether or not it's fitting into the four-year cycle. At the end of the day, uh, if you're not investing 10 years and you're, play and you're, you're trading at any level, whether it's uh, midterm cycles, uh, monthly, weekly, three-day, it doesn't matter what term you're, you're trading on. Uh, it doesn't really matter what part of the four-year cycle you're in. It matters what the metrics are saying. Uh, you know, in concert with each other, you know, because you're never going to look at RSI divergence and only trade on that. You're going to look at that mixed with, uh, you know, some of whatever other indicators you use, whether it be MACD, on chain, uh, supply, demand, it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, getting that concert of indicators that are uh, painting the picture for which you trade on. And in that case, it doesn't really matter where you're at the cycle, it matters where you're at in that current trend that you're trading. And I think that's really important to remember. Um, but we are we are going to be wrapping up here in a second, so we're just gonna we have three questions, three people that have requested. So if you can, uh, we're going to be trying to wrap this up here uh, in about twelve or fifteen minutes, right about uh, eight thirty Eastern Standard Time, uh, if we can. So try to keep your comment or question uh, fairly directed, uh, and it can be either to any of us, or you can ask anybody uh, specifically, or you can just make a comment of something that you're seeing, and we'd love to hear you. So first up, we're going to bring up. Uh, Crypto RL, uh, we've had him up a couple of times. He always has some really great things to add. So I'm um, looking forward to hear what he's got to say. So whenever you get on, just make sure to unmute your mic. And uh, we look forward to hearing what uh, what you got to share or ask. How are you doing, Crypto RL? Hi, guys. How are you doing? Hope you're doing good. Um, thanks for thanks for that. It's good listening once again. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, thanks for joining, brother. You're always here. Yeah, I'm, I'm always here, always listening. <laughs> I just wanted to raise a couple of points and get everyone's opinion, especially the, the speakers and Root. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I know going back in Bitcoin's cycles, it's it's never ever retested an old macro cycle top. So to me, it wouldn't make sense to go back and test 20k because it's never happened in Bitcoin's history, despite so many black swans and so many different things happening in the middle. You can you can get caught up in that narrative, can't you? But Bitcoin has never, ever retested an old macro cycle top. Um, and if you go back in Bitcoin cycles, it's never put in a top like we did. We got in summer and got back above that top like we did recently and then not gone on to set a higher high. Um, we've seen them running flats so many times in like past cycles. So and they've never, ever marked a cycle top. So I just wanted to see everyone's thoughts on that. I'll let uh, I'll let uh, Root. You could take it away first, since he uh, he he spoke about you uh, specifically. And then, if anybody else wants to jump in and give their thought, yeah. So I, I yeah again, I think it's incredible that we made. The, if I understood the the question correctly, so so you're wondering why we made, uh, or you think it's incredible that we made the 69k top. Uh, uh, compared to like pre in previous cycle, that never happened, right? Or I think I think just talking more specifically about if we were to break, if we if we were to break down from here and touch the 2017 2018 macro top uh, blow up because in the past I think I can't remember if it's the 414 or the 272 we don't uh, tend to go all the way down to test the last macro uh, bull top we t we test some fib just above it typically. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, I think for that, I, uh, I tend to look at realized price. So what realized price is, uh, is the, the, the cost basis basically, or that, that, that people, uh, enter into Bitcoin, you know, so the fair, the, the, the price that, that people buy Bitcoin at, because the market cap, you know, is, is the, the current, uh, the amount of Bitcoin that is in circulation times the current price. Right. But that, that's, I mean, it's still a useful metric in, in, in some ways, but but realized price is ac the actual price that people buy Bitcoin at. And and if you look at that, that is very good, like has been historically a very good indicator for, for bottoms, you know, so and, and that is around 24K. So I I would argue like I, I would think it's it's very unlikely to go below 24K. Um, and and therefore also we would not go below uh, the previous all time high of 20k like, let's say so uh, so so I think uh, and I even think you know it's it's likely that we we won't we won't even make it down that far I mean it very much depends on on also the macro uh, events that are happening so uh, I mean. Um, and, and we're, we're very correlated to the stock market, you know, because Bitcoin is a risk asset still uh, seen, seen as a risk asset. So so uh, the correlation is there. So, I mean, if we if we get a crash from the stock market or something, we surely would will at least at the beginning go down with it. And uh, so, for example, with with the Corona crash, we, we touched this realized price as well and uh, and then went, went back up straight up. So so uh, I, I do think it's possible to go there uh, if we do, we we likely do in, Q, in q1 uh, uh you know but it, as, as i said it also depends a bit on macro events uh if we if we don't get any like black swan events or so uh i i would argue that that the bottom is more likely to stay around 30k and, and maybe we will have a retouch and otherwise we will just uh maybe we ha already had the low right uh it, it, it very much depends but but surely a re retouch would be possible you know Hey, can I quickly just comment just because I, I have two floor models that I uh, created um, that have been just historically speaking to give you an idea, kind of the percentage probability we go to those levels. So one model I have um, is basically based on um, the thermal cap and it's a ratio. So it's um, multiples from the thermal cap. It's basically to do with the miners. So right now, currently, so this model is held for the last 10 years. It's never broke. Um, we've never gone below it in the last 10 years. And that current price, so the way the thermal cap works is it's, it's, it's essentially, it's the revenue of miners uh, cumulative throughout the entire history of Bitcoin. So every day you have the block rewards, you have fees, and it all accumulates, and that creates your thermal cap. And so based on mu uh, multiples from that, um, the floor currently is actually, uh, from on that model, is $20,250. And like I said, this has never broken the last 10 years. There's never been a wick below it. There's never been anything below it. Um, 
I don't think we get anywhere near that, but that is, in my opinion, the absolute floor. The only time we hit that is during the bottom of the bear market. Um, so, and that model, it cannot go low, lower. That model basically, every day it only goes up because it's, it, we accumulate more thermal cap and then we accumulate the multiple from that. So that is a slow grind, it slowly goes up, but that, that uh, floor can never go down. So it's at 2,000 or 20,250 right now, that's the one model. The other model I have is, um, I, won't ex I won't explain, <laughs> this kind of proprietary, but, but that one is actually only broke for four uh, single days throughout the entire um, last 10 years. It's, we've only had four single day closes below it. And one of those closes was on COVID. We got a one day close below that model and we came right back up. There was three other times we went below it. We came right back up uh, the next day. We had four candles below it, uh, single closes. Now that model is currently at um, high t 29s uh, um, to, to 32. So in my opinion, currently, there's a 99.99% .99 probability based on historical data that we do not go below 29. And there's basically zero chance we go below 20. Um, now, the, the second model I mentioned, the price does slightly move up and down based on the data inputs. But yeah, that's just kind of give you an idea. It would take, in my opinion, an extreme black swan to get us to those levels. It, just based on like historical, I think it's valuable to look at the past. I know it doesn't guarantee anything, but it gives you like a probability um, from the past. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And for anybody that's wondering uh, if they're having a hard time painting the picture in your mind with what he was just describing, if you go to, uh, if you click on his image or go to the real plan C, I think it's one of his last uh, few Twitter posts. He's got uh, some great uh, graphics uh, of charting of exactly what he's talking about with the, with the floor bands. And it's really, really great uh, info. Uh, and uh, so, all right. So thank you, Mr. Crypto RL. Uh, and unless you got something else specifically, I'm going to move on to because we got uh, two more people that we wanted to bring up here. So uh, we're going to bring up, uh, let's see, Main Street, Main Street Crypto. Uh, that's the wrong one. There we go. Main Street Crypto. Whenever you hop on here, just uh, hit the hit the mute button and hop in right with your question. We're looking forward to hear what you got. Hey, Kelly. Uh, thanks so much. Main Street Crypto here. Maybe the way I'll, I'll uh, phrase this question is. Um, you know, tell me why I'm wrong. You know, I'm sort of operating under the premise that we are in a bear market for Bitcoin, meaning that you know I don't think we hit new all-time highs until after the next halving in 2024. And the reason that I'm sort of operating under that premise, and again, you know, tell me why I'm wrong on this, um, is that while you know the lengthening cycle theory is gaining a lot of traction now that Bitcoin didn't hit you know, six figure price projections within the time that everybody was expecting it to. And I think the guy who's been running with that thesis for the longest has been Benjamin Cowan. Um, you know, but truth of the matter is, I think we, we, we hammered at a peak, you know, in the fall of the year in which Bitcoin was supposed to hammer in its peak. It just didn't get to the lofty levels that I think most people were thinking. So there's number one. Number two if you draw Fibonacci extensions from the peak of the last bull market to the bottom of the bear market when it was hammered in in December of 2019, that takes you to a full Fibonacci you know, super cycle extension, which is a 4.236 at about 73,000. Bitcoin almost nailed it perfectly. Uh, number three, we've been under the 50-day moving average for a little while now, and that just... Bitcoin's never done that in, in a bull market, you know, where the bull market's continued, where it's sustained, you know, weeks at a time under the 50 week moving average. And then number four. And I'll wait wait a sec. Wait a sec. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Do we I just I'm wondering if anyone knows this. Do we go below the 50 week in 2013 during the during the double top cycle? Actually, I don't believe I, so. I'll look right now as, as he continues. What he's saying. Okay. And then the last point is that. You know, I, I follow Elliott Wave, and I, th I think it's one of the best tools in technical analysis. And Bitcoin followed perfectly Elliott Wave from the bottom of, of the bear market in December 2019 all the way up through the peak of this past November. We got a perfect five waves up with five sub waves and three counter trend ABC patterns. And so, you know, I look at those elements of what's happened in Bitcoin and I'm just I just want to be on the right side of price. I, I, 
I'm not trying to be right in, in this at all. Uh, I just want to be on the right side of where I think price is going. And I think the opportunity here for the long term, which I'm uber bullish on Bitcoin, is being able to um, you know, buy sats at much lower prices than from where we are now. And I don't know where the bottom is, but it's for those reasons that I think the price has peaked until after the next halving cycle. So let me pause. And, and again, I guess the question is, what am I missing? How am I wrong? I'll let any, any, any of you uh, hop on that, that answer. I mean, mine will be super quick. I, I think the only thing that would change with you and make your statement wrong, the only thing that would, would change it would be if, like, uh, uh, I believe it was on chain or plan C. Someone said it, Root. It was a, a catalyst, right? But the demand for Bitcoin isn't quite there, no matter where you're looking at it, right? We don't have retail investors pouring in right now just trying to get um, uh, Bitcoin. We don't see that. We have people are scared. The fear and greed is is dropping down to you know your pitiful levels, right? It's like literally you're scared and pitiful. It's so it's so bad right now, and this is is really driving people away. And you know if something crazy happens right now, and all of a sudden we can only do stuff in Bitcoin and Florida, for, you know, secedes and becomes the only a Bitcoin country on its own. Who knows what's going to happen? But some sort of catalyst could send everything off and skyrocket the demand. And I think that's the only thing that would change it. Otherwise. You're right. Uh, yeah, and, to, and to his question, also, I'm looking at the. If I if I wasn't mistaken, he said the didn't. He said he didn't go below the fifty. Uh, the fifty SMA on the on the weekly. It didn't close week. on the weekly. Yeah, yeah. It's a sustained move below the fifty week. It it didn't it didn't go. It didn't even touch the fifty from May of 2012. All the way until uh, April of 2014. So yeah. it never, yeah, yeah. It, it, it almost. It's never down. been below it for this long. Yeah. Not in a bull market. Not in a bull market. Well, the, one of the things I will say though that everybody, we all need to remember is one, uh, as much as we look at historical data, uh, that's all well and good, and that's all that's all we have to look at, right? However, every Every month, the entire landscape of the crypto market is, is uh, very different from not only the month or two before that, but especially the cycle before that. Uh, this cycle, more in particular than any other cycle in history, because the number, exponential number of new people that have come into the market, but more specifically, the exponential number of dollars that are tied to either big money, institutional money, or traditional trading uh, psychology sort of money uh, players. And that being said, that's also why part, partly why the, the, the market's so directly tied to correlation with the traditional markets, because people are still trading with that same psychology. Uh, and so uh, I think there's a lot more money that's uh, because the market's so much smaller than, you know, gold or equities or derivatives or, you know, like in terms of the, the broader scale. And so big money has a lot of an easier way of, of moving the market in the ways they want to. Uh, which I think Root made an incredible point earlier uh, regarding, you know, this cycle peak where we've had so far, 64 and then 69. Uh, and I think Plan C brought it up as well. You know, we had a distribution sort of top rather than a blow off top. Well, was that potentially what was going to be a blow off top? However, we have institutional money in now. So uh, the way the way the price is shaped now is different. There, there's no way we'll really be able to know that. All we can do, as we said earlier, is to play every trend that we're in on whatever time period you're play you're uh, you're you're trading on, and you have to adjust your you have to be adaptable and adjust your strategy uh, as soon as the market shifts or the context of the market shifts, which is, seems to happen quite regularly this cycle. Uh, even on pattern trading, you know, you'll have an absolute clear breakout that has happened every time in history, and then you'll the the, the price will whipsaw one direction. And everybody will get liquidated out and then it whipsaws back to every other direction because people are sure it's going that way. Then they get liquidated out. Then it goes back to the original direction. So you really got to be careful with your trades. But I think that was a I think that was an excellent question. Did, did you have uh, one another small thing to add? We got uh, one more person. We're gonna bring, no, bring no, no, no. Just in the last five seconds here. Just want to give a quick shout out to the speakers. It's been a phenomenal conversation. Thanks for creating the space. And Kelly, thanks for calling me up. I appreciate it. Oh, we, we appreciate you. And we appreciate everybody that's uh, been joining here uh, here on Crypto Answered. Uh, again, on-chain uh, college, uh, crypto vet, rational route, uh, the, the real plan C, and then also Jesse Olson, who uh, he messaged me. He had to leave because he had something come up on his side. Uh, but we got uh, we got one last speaker here who's, who, who's been waving his hand for about uh, 
20 minutes and this is a uh, Bitcoin dollar dev. Uh, you're going to be coming on up. You get the last question. Uh, so it's got to be the best question of the night, right? Or the best comment. How you doing, uh, Bitcoin dollar dev? How you guys doing? Thank you for letting me speak, by the way. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I just have a question. And this goes off the past two speakers as well. Um, we didn't have a blow off top this cycle. So I don't know um, how we would go forward into the bear market. We are hitting the lows of the RSIs as like past indicators, you know, as what we use. But what about going parabolic? Now, we never went over the RSI. We weren't too overheated at all. So if you guys could comment on that, please. Yeah, ab absolutely. And what I want to do, we just uh, we have another special guest who just popped in as we're wrapping out our show, uh, Valerio here. He's uh, also another uh, excellent Twitter uh, personality, talking head, uh, analyst online. So uh, you could you get to come in at the very end and save the day, Mr. Valerio. How are you doing? Thank you for joining. And uh, did you have a, a, an answer for that gentleman's question there? Hello, by the way. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, Hi, first of all, before answering the question, I, I first want to say I have not been uh, paying attention that much to the market during the last two months because... Uh, because I had COVID in uh, in December and I had university exams, so I'm I'm really not uh, I'm really not the guy to answer any questions right now. But it was um, I mean it was great listening to all the ideas and and but I, I really should not uh, answer the questions right now because I'm not uh, that well informed. Oh well, I, I appreciate the honesty and sorry to hear you're sick. Happy to hear that uh, at least you're making it through it. And thank you, thank you for uh, tuning into the space and thank you everybody for tuning in. But uh, uh, we'll have you back on, Mr. Valerio, here in uh, our coming weeks, and we'll get you get you involved in the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on chain college, crypto vet, the rational root. I think root uh, had a comment from before, so I'll let root or on chain kind of take the final thoughts since I stole Main Street. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll just jump in real quick because. I know you mentioned RSI specifically, which is not something I focus on, but, um, you know, I, I think from an on-chain perspective, it's quite clear from a lot of metrics that the market is uh, underheated. Um, and so it, it's kind of hard to, you know, predict what the next top will be. I feel like that's the million dollar question. Will it be a, a parabolic top or will it be a, you know, slow distribution, slow grind up? Um, uh, and just to comment on the earlier point in terms of a new all time high, you know, when I think when we think about the market, uh, the market now is so different than the past. And so while I and others look at cycles and we look at historical data and we think about, you know, what happened in the past and in the price touched these data points X amount of times, et cetera. Um, the game has changed also. You know, we have institutions, we have countries, and we have uh, just so many uh, more players and just a whole different dynamic in the market. So I really think from in terms of an all-time high, that's going to be driven from a fundamental standpoint, creating hype, which is going to create demand. Right now, like others have mentioned, the demand is not necessarily here. But we have that hodler army. We have the, those long-term holders that continue to stack every day. And uh, that's only going to get stronger. So that's kind of my my view on uh, where the market's going, just mid short to midterm. Yeah, right on. I was I really really enjoy. And honestly, I, I really appreciate every every single speaker that's come up here uh, and such a wonderful conversation this evening. Uh, we 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 will be releasing uh, the recorded version of this. Uh, uh, probably tomorrow on uh, CryptoVet has a, a YouTube that we've been releasing the audio through. Uh, but such a wonderful conversation. Again, I want to say, I want to give Plan C a chance to, to, to if he has any wrap-up thoughts here, because I, I saw he, we're having some issues on the Twitter side, uh, getting, him, uh, getting him back up in here. So uh, if you want to wrap up any thoughts and uh, maybe, maybe some hopium for us going into the coming weeks with some stuff, or maybe some... Uh, maybe a fair warning based on what you're seeing, whatever comes to mind. And before I let you, before I let you on here again, this will be the last thing that, that will be shared. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us here on Crypto Answered. We will be back next week. So definitely make sure to follow all the speakers up here. Uh, myself, Plan, Plan C, uh, Valerio, OnChain College, CryptoVet, Rational Root, Jesse Olson. Uh, and again, thank you so much. So Plan C, take it away, my brother.
Yeah, I just wanted to mainly say I, I really appreciate you uh, inviting me to, to do this with you guys. It's a great panel and it's been a great discussion. And yeah, there's obviously tons more we can talk about, but I, I feel like we'll just keep having these every week or so. And just, I, I enjoy it. It's, it's great to get, you know, all these high level perspectives and then get questions from people that are also high level a lot of the times. And it's just a great uh, environment to do this. So I, I really appreciate it, everything. And yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, if you guys want to follow me on Twitter, that's where I'll be posting kind of my ideas and um, but yeah, I'll just, uh, I, I've personally, I feel like, um, yeah, just last thing I'll say, I guess, is I feel like, uh, yeah, mainly I, I just feel, I feel like the lows are close. Like I, I, you know, that 30, that 32 we put in, or, or I guess closer to 33, you know, um, we might hit, you know, might go down there, you know, a couple more times around the, the 29 to 33 level. But, uh, I feel like the market is getting close. Like we talked about already, there's a ton of indicators showing where, we're uh, very um, underheated and, and yeah, I just feel like we're going to, we just need a catalyst. Honestly, I feel like we just need a few announcements or even one big announcement and, and we'll be right back into either this continu a continuation of this cycle or like Root said, a completely new cycle. Either way, I think is a valid way to look at it. So yeah, thanks again, guys. Absolutely. And again, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we will be back next week. Uh, so definitely tune in. Uh, follow follow my Twitter where we'll basically we host it through my Twitter every week. Uh, follow all these other speakers and uh, just keep your heads up, keep your eyes on the charts, and but don't keep them on there too long. Sometimes you got to remember, even as exciting as this all is, go out and take a walk, read a book, hold the hand of of your lover, or your friend, or put your arm around your family member, have some good food, enjoy life. Remember, this is about freedom, right? Financial freedom, but that only comes when you have freedom in your own life as well. And we all do this, so we have really more sovereignty within our own life so we can have more time to do the things we love and spend it with the people we care about. Uh, so uh, big love to everybody here. Thank you again. And welcome back. Uh, we'll, we'll be welcoming you back next week, uh, either Wednesday or Thursday, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, everybody. Adios. Hey, a uh, big shout out to Soup and Dr. Ibo Hamid. These guys are great. And shout out to Plan C, Root, and Kelly. Thank you guys for everything.